Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Richardson here on behalf of Early Music Vancouver with Intimate Conversations. And I'm looking forward so much to being able to find out more from Rona Nadler and from Mike Fan all about an upcoming presentation on the Digital Concert Hall uh, coming to you on from October the 22nd. A presentation called Who Killed Leclerc? And uh, Rona joins us from Montreal. Mike is in Toronto. I'm in Vancouver, so we're uh, we're almost by coastal. Uh, nice, nice to be talking to you both, uh, Rona. Let, let me um, be begin with you because this is a presentation of the uh, organization with, with one of several with which you are affiliated. In this case, Infusion Baroque. And maybe you can just tell us a little bit to begin about Infusion Baroque, um, who you are and what you do. So Infusion Baroque is a quartet of four women who play period instruments, uh, Baroque violin, Baroque flute, Baroque cello, and myself on harpsichord. We're based in Montreal. Uh, we all went to McGill University around the same time. And we've been playing together in this group since 2014. Okay. and. Um, my sense from reading about you is that your, your presentations often have about them a kind of theatricality. Am I correct in that? Yes, indeed. So part of the idea of being infusion Baroque is that we wanted to infuse our Baroque concerts with something else. So we've done uh, different sorts of multimedia concerts and uh, concerts involving stories and narration and now this uh, you know, real theatrical show that we have with Who Killed the Claire. So yes, we try, uh, we basically never do a concert that's just, you know, go out and play and bow and leave. Uh, we try to have some kind of interactive or some other kind of artistic element always. Give me a couple of examples of the kinds of presentations you've done there. So, uh, well, I mean, Who Killed the Claire is a program we've been doing for some time. And before we had it in its current form with Mike Fan, um, we used to do it as uh, a game. So it was, uh, you'd, you'd show up and get a role at the door and the, the members of the audience would, would play roles in the murder mystery. So that was great fun. Although we found that it wasn't, um, it was a little bit difficult to tour with. Not everyone was quite sure what to do with it as we tried to pitch it to different people. Um, we've had, shows that incorporate like a slideshow of artwork alongside the music. And we also did a show uh, a few times where we had an artist who was actually creating a painting live while we played. And then at the end of the show, someone in the audience could leave with the painting. Huh. It was neat. Um, and then we've had lots of stories, lots of uh, concerts that just involve different kinds of stories. So we did a program for a long time called Rebels and Rivalries. Uh -huh. It was all about just sort of, uh, composers unbuttoned and their their personal lives and, and sharing little anecdotes about uh, famous composers, that sort of thing. Now you're the, the harpsichordist with the with the ensemble, but you sometimes sing as well. You do something I've almost never seen uh, a classical keyboardist who's also who also happens to be able to sing do, which is to sing while you play. Is that quite unusual? Is it as unusual as I think it is? <laughs> I suppose these days it is unusual. I think a lot of the um, song repertoire of the Baroque could have been self-accompanied. It's more likely that it would have been self-accompanied, say, on a lute rather than a harpsichord. Um, but I don't think in terms of period practice, it's so um, impossible that someone would have accompanied themselves. And I do have a soft spot for the sort of, you know, Nina Simone or Tori Amos <laughs> kind of mode. So yeah, I mean, I can do both and I enjoy them both. So, and it's a fun, it's sort of a surprise for the audience because if I've just been sitting there and playing the whole time and then, you know, in one of the numbers I sing, it's like, oh, <laughs> so, that's always fun. Have you ever worked as a lounge singer? Uh, not really, no, no, not, uh, not in any serious capacity, no. Oh, well, if this Baroque thing doesn't work out for you, you know, you've always got that up your sleeve. Now, Mike, Mike Fan, you are uh, somebody who wears quite a number of performative hats. You're a singer and an actor. You uh, appear in Who Killed Leclerc, as I understand it, 
as an actor, do you get to sing as well? Not in this one. And actually, I've been joking with everybody about um, because uh, I, I'm a tenor and a little bit more on the full lyric side. So the repertoire I sing is uh, usually more post Baroque, far past Baroque. Uh, I love Baroque music and I actually, um, I do wear many hats. Some of them have not been musical. I have a pre-med degree also actually. I began as a pianist and so had long experience with Baroque, but I like to joke that uh, this is a great project because I was hired to not sing Baroque music. <laughs> I don't sing in this at all actually, but uh, so it's really thrilling to be involved because and to be included because this project is strictly quite a virtuosic feat of theater acting for me. And uh, that said, it's a 16 page script in English and then a 16 page script in French. So 32 pages of text all together. And it's uh, quite special because the musicians have some lines as well too. In as Rona was mentioning, as I heard, the, the some of the original outings of the Leclerc project had the musicians playing a much more significant piece, significant piece of the acting and the investigating. And I'm relieving that burden for the most part. But uh, we still have some interactions. But primarily, it is me, and I play four characters because I play the investigator as well as three suspects. So it is quite wild. And then doing it in English, and then doing it all again in French. And um, live, you won't have both languages. But when we filmed, we had to do everything in one uh, language first, and then in the other. So it was uh, quite quite challenging, but quite rewarding. And looking like a million bucks. I mean, there's that. There's that as well. Oh, cool. thank you. Well, that's. <laughs> That's not my job uh, this time. Listen, I, 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 I'm mindful that uh, you, we've been talking for a while, but there's there's some important salient facts that we haven't disclosed to the audience uh, about Leclerc himself and, and about the episode that spawned this whole ep this whole thing. So, Ron, I, I, Ron, I'll just put this back to you. Um, what what happened to Leclerc on that night in October? And what was it, 1764? I think so. Yes. So. Well, the uh, the short answer is he was murdered. <laughs> uh, and according to police records, he was found the next morning uh, by one of his neighbors. And there was a whole police investigation and we have notes about different suspects and no one was ever charged with the crime. So it's a real life uh, unsolved whodunit. Okay, and how, how was he done in? Uh, he was stabbed in the chest. Mm. And, and was there a murder weapon anywhere? Was anything found that was, that, that was like, was it a knife or a fork or no? Well, you know, it was probably a knife. This kind of comes up in the, in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what instrument could have done this <laughs> deed? Um, but no, no, no murder weapon was found according to the information that we read. I mean, it's not, not to make light. It's 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 a dire story, of course. Uh, some some somebody died a violent death. Although, as an ex radio host, I, I think back on my um, we called it Radio Two in the day, uh, CBC Radio Music Now. And this this is exactly the kind of story that you would just jump on if you had to uh, in, introduce or backsell a piece of music by Leclerc, because of course it's so anecdotally rich. Was there uh, there must have been a big investigation at the time. Was was there a kind of Hercule Poirot who was involved? Was there um, an, an inspector of some kind? Mm -hmm. So the inspector, uh, Inspector Receveur, who is the, the main character in our little drama, uh, was the main, the, the lead detective. And so there are a lot of his notes on the mystery. And there's information about the different suspects, but there's also a lot of sort of miscellaneous weird stuff that was observed that night in the neighborhood. Um, someone mentioned that there was like a, a carriage running through the street with, with a horse and no driver, or there were like, you know, strange, you know, shady characters hanging out on street corners and no one knew who they were, like kind of weird details that people from the neighborhood volunteered that may or may not have tied in to the mystery, but it sort of sets a scene. Well, he was, uh, he, he had a house in the Marais district of Paris, which now is very recherche, but then it was, mm -hmm. I, I guess, the wrong side of the tracks. 
so he, he was living in, uh, well, he was living in a dodgy neighborhood. Anything could have happened, I suppose. Well, it, it, is, it is an amazing story. Tell me, Mike, maybe you can tell me a little bit about, uh, these are the roles you play. You, you, you play the, the inspector, as you said, Roosevelt, and you also play each of the three suspects. So who are they? So the three suspects are really from real life as well, too. Uh, which makes it fascinating because I'm playing four different historical characters and yet there's parts of them that have almost become larger than life because it's such a legendary story now. And uh, the, the, in chronological order as we meet them, we meet Paison, who's the gardener and the neighbor of Leclerc. And he is uh, one of these somewhat shady characters that is uh, maybe had some illicit activity going on, you know, besides the gardening and um, who else knows what was in his garden, you know, and uh, he was not a fan of Leclerc's music, sadly. Uh, he, you know, in the script, it talks about how he's so, uh, you know, you know, aggravated by the ramblings and, you know, because Leclerc was a composer, so he was always, you know, playing with different fragments and it was going nowhere sometimes and really drove him kind of mad. So, you know, possible motive. And then we meet, uh, oh, we meet the cat. <laughs> it's yeah, not one of our suspects. Cat has appeared. <laughs> yes, okay. cat has appeared. I love it. My cat is staying away for the moment. Um, but maybe she'll make an appearance later as well. But uh, the second character is actually Leclerc's widow. And um, she obviously cared about Leclerc very much. But at the time of his murder, was um, they were separated. So things were were a little tense and a little bit awkward between them. But she she was excuse me for interrupting, but she she was also um, and 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 Rona, maybe you can speak to this. She I don't know how unusual this would have been, and they, my my sense is probably quite unusual. She she was a professional. She was an engraver. She was a music engraver, wasn't she? Yes, she was a music engraver. Yeah. So how how usual would that have been for a woman of the day? Do you suppose? You know, I'm not going to go out on a limb on this question. I don't feel like this is uh, something I can say for sure. I know oh. that there were a lot of musical professional women, right. um, especially if women were born into a family where that was sort of the family trade, mm -hmm. then they would be a part of the trade. And so I could imagine that this would be so sort of a family of artisans and um, the right. daughters might take up the trade as well as the sons, that sort of thing. But I'm not sure um, how widespread that necessarily was in society. Oh, okay. Would, would, would her work as an engraver have given her access to a sharp pointy instrument that might've been used to stab somebody three times in the chest? That's an excellent question. And uh, it comes up in the show, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, given the fact that these stab wounds were lethal Probably not the work of a, you know, small pointy music engraving tool, but who knows how hard she stabbed him. <laughs> how much rage? <laughs> if she was motivated. If she had like very good aim, maybe. And, and the, third, the third suspect is, is uh, Vial, have I got that right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Vial? Yeah. Vial. And, and who is Vial? He's uh, the nephew of Leclerc. So also related to him, but this time by blood and uh, an up and coming violinist himself, uh, a little bit arrogant, I must say, but, um, you know, very clever. But uh, this one I find the most fascinating. Well, I find all of them fascinating, but the, I think the scenario is fascinating because his interaction with the inspector, they're both kind of very pompous and very confident um, men. There's a little bit of this uh, duel and this standoff between them and this tension. Uh, so it's quite a, a you know, the, I feel like, you know, the inspector kind of like meets his theatrical match in a way. But uh, yeah, all of them are so different. So they're all very dramatic in their own ways. They all have motives, possibly. They all have uh, lots of emotions and feelings behind this whole situation as well, too. So uh, yeah, you really have to tune in. And, and yes, there is uh, there are various murder weapons presented. And in the film version and in our show, actually, we have a variety of things for me to um, dangle around. So. <laughs> Well, can, can, can you tell me, Rona, a little bit about the, the relationship between uh, Rosseveur and, and the other characters that Mike plays uh, over the course of Who Killed Leclerc, and, and you as musicians, and also talk a little bit about the repertoire you're playing? For sure. So the show is supposed to be being played to an audience. So the inspector uh, addresses the audience 
at various points. And in the film, we had a kind of a, you know, studio audience who uh, are part of the film as well. And then the musicians are also sort of the audience in a way for Reciver's exposition of the investigation. So uh, we're there to play music for the concert or for the party. Um, and our priority is to like get on with the show and his priority is to solve the mystery. And so there are some sort of funny interactions um, between the musicians and the inspector. Um, you know, he'll ask us questions, you know, intense questions. Who do you think did it? And we'll be like, well, I don't know. Can we just like play our next piece, please? And <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and some funny props as well. That was, that was fun to do. So that's sort of how the musicians come into it. We're, we're in the room, we interact with the inspector, but um, we're there for a different reason, definitely. And then the fact that we're playing all this music by Leclerc is also a, you know, very, um, I guess, an implicit homage mm -hmm. to him. Um, so we're good. playing mainly trio sonata repertoire, of which there's quite a bit from Leclerc, including um, maybe one of his more famous pieces, the Deuxième Récréation de Musique. We do a few excerpts from that. And then there are some excerpts from a violin sonata, and um, also when we used to do sort of the older version of this, we used to make it a little bit more, not just Leclerc, but sort of Leclerc and his milieu. So mm -hmm. we had some music by other composers who were sort of in his orbit. So Jean-Pierre Guignon was one of them. Also uh, Locatelli, who was a teacher of Leclerc. And so I think there's maybe some other kind of incidental music in the film, maybe the credits music or something like that, that uh, comes from these other composers. What, what makes Leclerc Leclerc? When, when you, you think of him as a composer, uh, he, he, there aren't that many composers from the French Baroque whose names we still recognize today. Leclerc would be one of them, apart from the uh, spectacular and unfortunate means of his hand. <laughs> what, what, what is it about him that makes him so outstanding? So he was definitely a violinist par excellence. And I think violinists, Baroque violinists would say that there's um, the kind of technical challenges and the way that he uses the instrument are really unique. Um, so on that score, I think he's quite significant. And also he's one of these somewhat later Baroque composers who's really merging the French with the new Italian style and making something that's very lively and varied and still has that um, French je ne sais quoi, but brings in a lot of other elements. And so uh, I think he does that particularly well. Okay, thanks. Well, listen, you've both been very generous with your time. I, I'm gonna ask just one last thing if, if you've got the patience for it. And that's that yeah, this is a, a film presentation. We'll ask two other questions. Where was it shot? You, where, where'd you shoot this piece? What was the location? It's a house of a friend of ours, a colleague of ours in Westmount. Very generous friend. <laughs> he has a great house and we've, we've used it on different occasions for, for, you know, house concerts or little fundraisers and things. She has this great big foyer. So yeah, it was oh. at her house. And they appear in the film as well too. So. Oh, great. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So, so um, you have a film version and you have, as you say, invited guests. So they're going to behave as they ought in terms of uh, facilitating the drama. But when you do it as a show uh, and, and you've got an invited audience and it comes to a time when, as I, I suppose it must, when uh, the audience has to weigh in on who they think uh, the, the most likely suspect is, what if, they, what if they don't go the way they should? Like, have you got many, many different endings that you have to draw on depending on who they select? I mean, if they select, uh, Paisan, the, the, the gardener, or Louise, the engraver, or Vial, the nephew, is, I mean, they, they could go one way or the other. So how does the inspector in a scripted piece respond to that? Well, it's a very good question. And everyone has to come because it will be different. There will be things that are different than the film, uh, yet still interactive. So yes, to answer your question, there are different endings. Um, because just like in history, we, we don't know, we still don't have the answer. So I think it's a really fun thing that there's this alternate ending uh, reality. And in the film version, actually, we only filmed one ending, 
but it's not the only ending so people have to come live to really see what the possibilities are so that'll be fun because we we didn't get a chance to do that with an with a live audience yet and it will affect how the piece will go and um you know and especially with live theater it's going to be much more interactive and less fixed the same uh -huh. time with the film version there's a lot of movie magic in terms of you know the magic of you know because i think there's this very kind of magical idea that the director took with the piece and uh, there's moments where things appear or disappear or you know things that will be unique to the film version also so it'll be great for people to really experience both because it will be will, it will be different it won't be the same uh, same old thing um when uh, people come uh, to okay. multiple iterations well thank you both and and the last thing i will mention i don't think we've actually spoken his name yet we probably should uh, we definitely should and that's the playwright whose name is roger Hyams. Uh, and uh, I, I also don't know that we've made it clear that it's a play in verse, which is a very challenging thing to write. And for, for you, Mike, obviously a very challenging thing to perform as well, both in English and in French. Well, yes, and I will say as well, uh, Roger, Roger is supremely gifted, but it's mostly an iambic pentameter. Uh, there's some blank verse, there's some rhyming couplets, but it's so masterful. And especially in our interactions, he also splits lines between musicians and myself. It's so elegant and intricate. I want to mention as well too, while we're while we're giving credit to this beautiful written material, that the French translation was done by Joël de Silva, and it's it's not just a translation because if you can imagine uh, with something. Uh, rhyming and so intricately done metrically, uh, he actually reimagined it. So, which in a sense also did make it difficult for me because it was the similar material but still quite a different uh, text. And in the French version, he uses Alexandrine, which is a French metrical uh, meter, instead in certain parts, not all the way. And so it still captures this kind of as poetical poetic essence, but in a very different way. So both of them very brilliant and also very different in, in their own right. So that's wonderful because it's you know terrible when you have a wonderful script in one language and when it's translated, it loses that. But I think the French version gains so much more. And because it happened in France, Joël really um, was able to integrate much more of the Frenchness into that version of it. So yeah, really a privilege to work with this really well-crafted material. Okay, well, thank you both so much. Uh, look forward very much to seeing who killed Leclerc. Infusion Baroque and Mike Fan performing Receveur, Paysan, Louise, and Vial. And uh, thanks so much for spending this time here on Intimate Conversations for Early Music Vancouver. I wish you all the best. Cheers. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Yee, ciao.